Before we get into today's video, I did want to let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had a wonderful week. I hope everybody is doing good out there, drinking your water, lots of it. Yes, yes, yes. Going outside, going for a walk, taking care of yourself, making sure you're getting vitamin D, loving yourself, being kind to yourself, all that good stuff. Awesome. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about Eric Smith. Have y'all heard about Eric Smith? Now this situation happened back in 1994, but it's very intriguing, especially if you stay to the end, because at the end of the video, it's going to have a very, 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 very shocking ending. If you guys don't already know me though, hi, my name is Christina. I do have a second channel, which is Casually Christina. We do things more casually over there. I also have a Patreon. My Patreon is for 18 and up. And over there we do more personal story times. We go live. I have a $2 tier, which is all the true crime stuff that I cannot put on YouTube due to their terms and policies. We also go over crime scene photos and stuff like that over there. If you guys would like to come and join, it's a good time y'all. You, you might want to come and join. And then I also have an Instagram as well as a Facebook. And those are always linked down in the description box. If you'd like to come and check me out. So Eric, 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 Eric Smith, this guy right here, red hair, big thick glasses, big ears and freckles all over his face. And he also had a speech issue growing up and therefore he kind of had a hard time as a kid. I mean, you guys know if any of y'all are parents, you know, kids can be really mean, but let's just kind of rewind it a little bit. So Eric Smith was born in January of 1980 in New York. He lived in a very small, quiet town. There was only 972 people in his whole entire town back then. And so everybody knew everybody. This was definitely the type of town that you would want to raise a family in because neighbors became family. The person that worked at the grocery store became friends, you know, like, it was a very, very close and tight knit, basically zero crime. I mean, the most crime they had was if somebody got a speeding ticket. And even then, if the cops pulled you over, they knew you. It was probably your cousin, your uncle, your pappy, something like that. So they, they knew you. So it was just that type of like small town, tight knit vibe. Now, Eric's mother's name is Tammy. And then he had his biological father and there was some issues between Tammy and his biological father. As a matter of fact, they used to argue all the time and he ended up leaving the home and therefore Tammy was raising her children by herself. It is said though, that he ended up coming back at some point and they had another baby and then he left again, but he was never ever involved in Eric's life. And the sad thing about it is, it is said that his biological father would come and pick up his little sister and take her places and do things with her, but never acknowledged Eric. And so that had to hurt Eric growing up. But also, Tammy, Eric's mother, had epilepsy growing up. And at the age of five, she was put on an epilepsy medication named trimethadone. And since she had been taking it since she was five, she took it the whole entire time she was pregnant. And when she was pregnant with Eric, not only was she taking this epilepsy medicine, but she was also taking an antidepressant as well. And so back in the early 1980s, when he was born and she was pregnant in 1979, there wasn't as much research or known side effects back then, like we know now, and come to find out years later that epilepsy medicine that she took for seizures 
actually does have a, an effect on pregnant women and the unborn baby, but let's keep going here. Now, when Eric was going to elementary school, it was really hit or miss with him. His teachers definitely described him as being a child that would have outburst, he would get angry, but then you would have other teachers that would say, well, it was no different of anger than any other small child. You know, because when you got fifth grade and below, kids can get frustrated, they can get you know, mad. They can, mm, I don't want to do this, throw their pencil on the floor. I mean, sometimes kids do that. So how do you know when it is something alarming or when it's not? But they did know that he would have these anger outbursts. He was also a loner and stayed to himself because other kids would pick on him. They would pick on him because of the way that he looked or the way that he talked. And because of that, he didn't really want to talk to a lot of other kids because of his speech impediment. And he just had a hard time in school all the way around. While Eric was in grade school, Eric's mother, Tammy, met a man named Ted Smith. Now, Ted Smith would go on to marry Tammy and then adopt Eric. And that's how Eric became Eric Smith and Tammy Smith and then Ted Smith. And then the whole family came together as one. He took Eric under his wing like this was his son and he raised him like a son, he loved him like a son and he spanked him like a son, a stepson, or whatever. Now, Eric's stepfather would testify in court that he had anger issues as well. It was rumored later on within the community that maybe he was a little to Eric and the other kids, but that's not the way Ted described it in court, which shocker there, right? But he described it as he had anger outburst. Nevertheless, so at this point, Eric Smith is having a hard time in school and at home. One of the neighbors said that Eric was so sweet that he was different than other kids because he would come over and help mow the lawn or do the dishes. But then you had other people in the neighborhood that said that basically like he was a little stinker. You're a mean looking dude, you know that? Eric had been teased about his appearance. He wouldn't talk or he would throw rocks and they didn't, they didn't find him as sweet and cuddly as maybe some of the other neighbors did. But the people that really loved him and loved spending time with Eric was his grandparents. Red and Eddie Wilson, they just loved Eric so much. And Eric loved going over to their house and spending time and getting away from his own home and you know, his siblings and getting to just be with his grandpa and his grandma. They said that he was a little clown and he would do all kinds of things to make them laugh. And he always came to them for hugs and kisses and for lots of affection and they gave it to him. They loved their grandson, Eric, so much. Now, Eric was having problems in grade school and he ended up getting held back twice. So he was in the fifth grade and he was 13 years old. And this is when his anger and outburst began to get worse and worse. He would yell and scream and kick things. It is even said that he set his kitchen on fire at one point. And it was also around this time that the bullying at his school got really, really bad. In fifth grade, it was horrible. His sister would later say that there was even a kid that got off of the bus that took his backpack and dumped it upside down and shook everything out of it and then told him to pick it up in front of everybody. He would get pushed around, he would get hit, he would get his hair pulled, his glasses slapped off of his face, and he just had it rough. Then he would get off of his bus, go home, and feel unhappy at home as well. Now, one of the neighbors whose son was the same age as Eric said that Eric came to their house to spend the night one night. She would later say that her son said that he woke up because he felt something really hot on his face and it was Eric standing over him with a cigarette burning his nose. There's also rumors and things and articles that I found online that said Eric would hurt animals and would do stuff like that too. And so it's just so confusing because you have some people, and I don't know if it's just a grandparent thing, you know, that's like, oh, he's so sweet. He wanted hugs and kisses and maybe he did really love them or that one neighbor that he would cut the grass, but then you would have like these anger outbursts and trying to set a kitchen on fire or, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. It seemed like different people got different versions of Eric, but everything would change for Eric and that small town forever in August of 1993. On August 2nd of 1993, Little Derek Roby was getting ready to go to a program. Now, little Derek Roby was four years old, big, bright eyes, blonde hair, athletic, 
playful, funny, loved his family. His father's name is Dale and his mother's name is Doreen. He was the oldest of three children, but at this point in time, in 1993, he had one little brother who was 18 months old and Derek loved his little brother. He would kiss his little brother and talk to his little brother. He was also very independent little four-year-old. He would go fishing with his dad and he was a huge daddy's boy as well as a mama's boy, but he loved his daddy. They were so super close. Well, typically little Derek would go to this program in the afternoons. And on this day, on August 2nd of 1993, his mother was dealing with his 18 month old little brother who was fussy and kind of in a tizzy. And four year old Derek said, mommy, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go by myself. And she said she never let him walk by himself. But on this day, she thought, okay, she was overwhelmed. She was in a tizzy. And I know y'all are all going, <gasps> he was four years old. Whether it was right or wrong, whether you would do that or I would do that, I do got, want you guys to keep in mind, this is 1993, okay? This is a small community where everybody knows everybody. And for him to walk to this program meant he went out his house onto the sidewalk on the same side of the street and just walked down the street a little bit. He didn't have to cross over no stop signs. He didn't have to do anything. Didn't have to cross over the road. And again, everybody knew everybody. And so on this day, his mother said, okay, and let him go. And she would regret that decision for the rest of her life. As little Derek began to walk down the sidewalk on the way to his program, feeling all independent, taking big steps, Eric, came riding by on his bicycle. Now, Eric was in a summer camp and he had gotten kicked out this day for bad behavior. They told him he needed to leave, so he hopped on his bike to ride home. Being mad and angry riding home, he saw little blonde hair, super cute, super adorable, four-year-old Derek walking down the road. And he pulled his bike up next to him. He ended up talking little Derek into following him into the woods to play. Now you guys, any of y'all that have children, you know, these little ones look up to the bigger ones, right? Like you got the bigger brother, the bigger sister and says, Hey, I want to play with you. But they drop everything and then they go. I could just imagine how this little boy got off track thinking this big, cool kid on a bicycle wants to play with him in the woods. However, when they got into the woods, Eric, old little four-year-old Derek to death. After that, he took a big rock. He like dug this rock up that was in all this mush. And it was said, I read one article that said the rock weighed like 25 pounds. I mean, that's a huge rock and crashed it on the baby, the four-year-old boy's head. And then after he did all kinds of stuff to his body, it had cuts on it. He went into the little boy Derek's lunch bag that he had with him where he had like a banana and he had some Kool-Aid packets, you know, like the little sugar things. And he took the sugar Kool-Aid packets and he poured them into the little boy's cuts. <sighs> then he essayed the little boy, okay? The 13-year-old essayed the little four-year-old. And then he ended up doing other things to his body and leaving him and going home. Around this time is when Derek's mother said she just felt a panic. She was like, oh, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. So she went to go look for her baby to make sure he made it to the program and he didn't. At this point, she went and called the cops. The cops came, they started a full on investigation. Everybody in the community was looking for this baby because again, small community, everybody knows everybody including Eric. Eric was even out looking for this little boy. The cops came and questioned Eric and everybody else and he just stood and talked to them. He said at one point he saw little Derek walking and the investigators thought that maybe he knew something and, but they definitely did not think that he did anything and the whole entire community is looking for an adult. Everybody, th including myself, thought it was an adult. And how could anybody do such a terrible, terrible thing? They're all thinking like, what monster is in, in, in our midst here, right? Like everybody knows everybody. I've said it a million times. So you guys got to think like they're looking at each other. Like, is it Bob at the corner store? Like, is it Martha at the library? Like 
Somebody did this. If it was somebody else that wasn't in the community, somebody would have saw them. So it is one of you, right? And the mother is feeling devastated. She's crying out on the news saying, somebody please help, you know, help me find out what happened to my boy, da, 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 da. Eric's mother said she had a gut feeling that her son knew something. So she began to question him. This is a couple days later. She said that when she questioned him, Eric turned to her, looked at her and said, I did it. Now she didn't even think he did it. She just thought maybe she, he saw who did it. Eric's mother, Tammy said she lost control. She was screaming. She was crying. She was losing it. She was asking him why. And he kept saying, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He started crying. And so she took him down to the station and this is where he confessed. I got him by himself. And I strangled him. I hit him over the head with a rock numerous times and poured Kool-Aid on him. And I became the bully that I hated in school. I became the individual who dished out pain. They thought that I knew who did it or I had seen who had done it. But the person they were looking for is me. I couldn't hold it in anymore. They arrested him, little 13 year old Eric, and they released into the news media that they had a confession from the killer. So at this point, all the news media outlets are circling around trying to get a glimpse of who this man or woman is that did this to this baby. The parents, everybody, they're outside the courthouse crying. And when they bring the little boy out in handcuffs to transport him, everybody gasps. They see a little redhead boy with glasses on and freckles on his face and nobody knows what to think or do. Like a kid, a kid doing this to another kid. It was so hard for this community and the parents and all the parents and the gruesome details of what he did to this four-year-old was almost too much for them all to bear. Now they ended up going to trial. The defense really tried to use that meta epilepsy medication that the mom had taken, but the jury did not accept that. And they also tried to use his childhood and being bullied because when he was giving his confession, he said that he wanted this perfect little boy to feel, you know, he wanted to hurt him. And he also told them that he knew that he was defenseless and that's why he did it. Like the people that inter not interrogated, they only had to question him. He told them the people that listened to his confession had cold chills because they could not believe the 13 year old little boy was talking like this and saying these things. Like it was like a nightmare, but he ended up getting found guilty and they sentenced him to nine years to life in prison. So of course the mother and the father are crying like nine years to life. Like he should never have a chance to get out in nine years, especially, but the courts are saying like, he's a kid, you know, he can change and da, 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 da. So he gets into prison for the nine years and every two years after that nine years, he had a parole hearing and the biological family of that little boy that got murdered had to come back to court every two years, okay? Until this year, Eric was denied parole 10 times. So now that he is 43 years old, he is being released and he is going to be in New York. He's gonna be on parole. And he did a bunch of interviews saying that like he was a miserable child back then and how he's changed and the family of the little boy who was murdered say that they are relieved in a way because they are tired of having to go back to parole every two years and beg to keep him in there. So now it's just done. They can, they can move on with that part. But they're also concerned because they feel like he could be just deeply disturbed and evil and not something that you grow out of. And so I wanted to ask you guys, what do y'all think? What do you think? Do you think that something that gruesome is something that you can grow out of. Now we'll say this, Eric has only had in all of his years in prison, I think it's 27 years, three write-ups, the whole 27 years, and they were all minor infractions. They were all like small stuff, not fighting or violence or anything like that. And so, but then again, 
we know that Eric was never the type that was going to stand up to bullies or people bigger than him or stronger than him, like could be in prison, right? He went after smaller, weaker. So I don't know if I'm too impressed by the fact that he didn't like do anything to anybody in prison because I'm just not, but I will be interested to see how his life is now. But this just creeps me out even more because and now we're into my opinion of the situation. When I said the part that you would be surprised, maybe is the fact that he did just get out after 10 parole hearings. This is what I mean when I say that I don't personally trust even children around my children. Everything says like, you know, you got to watch the adults or strangers mostly. Like that's the undertone of our society is like a boogeyman is going to get our kids. But, but typically 95% of all perpetrators that, you know, kidnap a child or something like that, or touch them in a way are people that are trusted family members, friends, school officials, church officials, people that we know and that our children trust. Like that's what should be plastered all over everything, right? Is that people that you know and trust and people that your children trust, but also children, okay? And I'm not saying that there's a mega, mega billion amount of children like Eric out there running around, but I always say like, you don't know what's going on in a child's home, right? Like you wanna let your child go spend the night over at their friend's house and you went and met their parents. Hi, how are you? Okay, I'm just meeting you. You don't know what their daddy is really like. You don't know what their mama is really like. You don't know if they have an older brother, a younger brother, an older sister, a younger sister. You don't know what their friend does. Maybe grandpa, you know, was a little too friendly with them. And then they feel like they want to be a little friendly with your child. You know, like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't trust it. My baby don't spend the night with nobody other than my, my in-laws. That's it. That's the only place he spends the night at. That's just how it is. We can play all day long. Now, I do let kids come and spend the night at my house sometimes, but that's also at our house. And I'm, I do the best I can, y'all. But we can play all day long. What, y'all want to go to the beach? Y'all want to go to a theme park? Y'all want to go to the park? Y'all want to roast hot dogs on the grill? You want to roast hot dogs on the fire pit? Come on over. Let's do it. Y'all want to stay in, you know, roast marshmallows after dark? I'll take you home afterwards. Like, that's just how it is. That's how I am. Because it's just, you don't know. And the innocence of children, sometimes things happen and it takes a piece of them that you can't get back, you know? doesn't mean that children can't grow up and have a successful loving life. I feel like I am one of them and a lot of y'all are out there too. But also, if you know better, you got to do better. What do you guys think? Do you think about, you know, the potential of other children doing things? Or do you just think about adults? Or have you always been that way? Or, you know, what do you think? Do you think that Eric should have had another chance and is released? Or do you think like, no, his parents are without their child. And so he can be in there too. He's not dead. I mean, he's still got a life in there. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section down below. Other than that, my loves, thank you so, so much for watching this video. Please do not forget to like it. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Go outside. Drink your water. Bye. We are, we are dreaming in the dark. We are nothing more than dust. Search, but you stay lost. We are, we are reaching for the stars.